she very kindly showed me around and then facilitated for me to have a, a visitor pass um, for six months, which enabled me to go when I wanted. So, initially, I spent a lot of time just wandering around looking at these cupboards, um, and they extend from floor to ceiling, across four floors, across five buildings, um, and I would sort of open and close them at random, really, looking at what was inside and seeing all the mounted specimens. Um, and I, I didn't really know what I was looking for in a system that I didn't really understand, um, except there are seven million specimens there, so everything I did felt very arbitrary. But a couple of things happened in those visits which I think informed the approach I eventually took. Um, and the first was uh, observing a taxonomist at work as she sort of looked and processed and studied some new specimens of palms that had come in from Madagascar. And she studied these specimens over and over again, um, trying to initially just identify them, because until the specimens are identified, they cannot be incorporated <coughs> within the collection. One day I came in and found her swearing at them. And she called, she called, she, she always referred to them as my guys. But she was saying, oh, guys, you're so bloody slippery. And that was that whole sort of notion of these specimens which couldn't quite be placed, which were extremely similar in many ways to certain known species, but differed in the, I think it was in the infructessence, but were also very similar to another. So this whole notion that um, there are kind of blurred lines um, as well as categories became very interesting to me. Um, and that's when I first came across this whole idea of um, taxonomists being splitters or lumpers. In other words, do they have a tendency to want to split the natural world into more and more different species or to lump and categorise as you referred to? Um, so, and eventually, in fact, he did decide that this was, that this was a new species. Um, and the other thing that happened was one day to arrive um, and to find the place in what felt like chaos, really, for such an ordered, tranquil uh, place, because there were towering boxes uh, all over the place, and it was explained to me that this was part of a reorganisation. Um, a reorganisation that happens kind of once every generation or so um, because the system is put under so much pressure from new acquisitions, so physical specimens needing to be absorbed, but also new knowledge, you know, in, which means that kind of some of those old categories and certainties become outdated, so that need to physically move things. Oh yeah, I think we're going to come back to that in a bit more detail. Sure, That's fine, yeah. okay. Move me on. Sure, you want me to finish? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Mark. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we've got a lot to get uh, through. Uh, Mark. Um, hi, my name's Mark Connor. I'm the curator of the Grand Museum of Zoology at UCL. Um, I hope you've been just around the corner. Please do come along. Um, open Mondays to Saturdays, 1 to 5. Uh, it's a relatively small museum. It's a zoology, zoology museum, so it's only animals. Uh, we have 68,000 specimens, and you've already heard the kinds of sizes that natural history museums you know, get to them when they're measured in the millions. Uh, and the collection I work with started as Lives of Teaching Collection in uh, the 1820s. So it was never meant to be a museum. It was just uh, supposed to be teaching students anatomy, comparative anatomy, zoology. Uh, and it's been repurposed as a museum. And a lot of natural history museums are sort of, sort of in the same bag. But they started with one intention, either a private collection or a teaching collection. And the problem we have today is the, what's called the backlog. So trying to translate that 200 year old collection with all kinds of labels, scrolls, spit marks, bits of paint all over the place, mark, red paint, blue paint. Trying to translate all of that uh, as well as updating the taxonomy. So um, at some point I hope we'll explain taxonomy for those who don't quite know what we mean by that. But uh, the name taxonomy, this, this system of uh, classifying um, life on Earth. Um, it's a really, really convenient filing system, if you want, for, for trying to file and organise a 3D collection from skulls to things preserved in fluid, it depends on etymology. But fundamentally, it's broken, and now there's four or five different versions of it, depending on whether you're a geneticist or a botanist or a paleobiologist. 
So, uh, my angle tonight, I guess, is uh, it sort of feels weird because it's inside baseball. So, this is the stuff you don't see in the museum. You know, we put out this nice, ordered, uh, lovely, clean series of displays. Um, but of course, as many of you are nodding, it's an absolute mess behind the scenes. It's 200 year, uh, you know, scientists very, very uh, focused on what they're doing right there and then. So, we need a hundred, we need a thousand of these things for this new study, and then when they're finished, you know, um, Seems like they had to be destroy all their notebooks, chuck it in a box, <laughs> write rubbish on the side, and then 200 years later I come to that box and have to work out whether it is rubbish or whether it's you know, some of the most important specimens uh, in museums. Um, and the other thing is, uh, tonight what I hope to be talking about is how we record all kinds of information. So it's this really pedantic uh, set ways of recording information so they'll be useful to people in 200 years. So I don't want my successor to be sitting the gallery of the future slagging me off as I am my, uh, my predecessors, um, but how we prepare that information for the future, how we incorporate uh, things like, uh, as an example, social media. So museums are looking at how do we record social media around collections, because before there would have been letters and other archives, and also why, so why do we do it? Um, it seems weird, you have this whole sector of people who, who are organising collections, um, why are we doing it and who are we doing it for? Uh, which isn't necessarily an easy question to answer. And that's me. Uh, I'm Helen Pinor. I'm an artist working across a broad range of media, um, new media, photography, sculpture, it's bio art, etc. Um, and my practice focuses very closely on transitional zones. So zones that exist between states that are in some way ontologically uncomfortable. So um, one of the um, projects that I've focused on in the last three years very intensely with my collaborator, artist Peter Clancy, is um, the transitional zone between life and death. So we tend to think about death as a, a sort of instant in time and our death certificates tell us that it happened in an instant in time, but when you dig down a bit more deeply into that, you find that death and life are much more interdigitated or um, there's a much more ambiguous border or um, transitional zone between life and death. And that's one of the things that we've explored extensively in our work. Um, and when you start to look at things like the legal frameworks around how death is defined and um, the technologies that are available, for example, in organ transplantation, you, all of that ambiguity is laid out. For you, it becomes very clear that it's a contentious um, edge, if you like. Um, previous <coughs> previous bodies of work that I've looked at have um, or done have <coughs> explored other transitional zones, like the one between nature and culture, excuse me, <coughs> or um, the um, the transitional zones between the material body and consciousness. That's been something that I've been consistently interested in because, again, that's a zone that we don't yet have a fix on. We don't even really have the beginnings of an understanding of how consciousness and materiality actually touch each other or, or interface with each other. So these are the kinds of places that, that are captivating and interest me in my work. And the project that I've done for, um, that Tom's included in this exhibition is called The Life Raft. And it's two works from a bigger series of works, the, the whole series is 18 images. And it explores another kind of transitional zone. I'm going to read a very short piece um, that I've written about this particular piece of work that is really just an introduction to the starting point for the work. Um, the project started with my chance finding a, a Victorian insect and crustacean collection owned by an antique dealer friend of mine. The collection was in the process of crumbling into disrepair, some drawers being essentially a pile of dust, others having definable creatures, but in various states of transformation towards dust. My friend didn't know the provenance of the collection, and in this way the collection was adrift, with only its specimen labels to offer clues. I was captivated by the immense but quiet pathos of the collection, somehow emblematic of the life of the collector who had assembled it, and of the species represented whose fate was unknown, at least to me. The specimens were collected in Sierra Leone in England, a narrative with whiffs of the colonial era about it, 
and some of these species may now be extinct. But what the collection drew out more definitively was the transitional nature of the specimen, its susceptibility to change and evolution. As Tom notes in the exhibition catalogue, whilst we imagine specimens to be somehow frozen in time for our future perusal, the specimen embarks on a second journey towards death. It gradually derobes itself of its usefulness to us as specimen and ultimately reunites itself with its earlier destiny, joining the ranks of dust and simple minerals to re-enter new chains of creation and beingness. The decay of immense buildings made by previous cultures or of tiny creatures charged with the important role of being specimens perhaps ignites in us a similar sense of unarticulated outrage and dismay as they insistently remind us of death, impermanence and our own ultimate fates. So that's the intro. Thank you. Um, we've actually done that slightly quicker than I have in space. Um, <laughs> so um, I was going to say a couple of things before we kind of uh, go into the discussion. One is, if anyone throws out a word, that I don't know what level of audience we're talking to. Um, so if anyone throws out a word that's making sense, they put their hand up and throw something. And I can ask that someone to gloss it. Um, you've already pointed out that we haven't really covered what taxing actually means. Um, so we can do that in a second. I to do that. Um, the other thing is also, um, you mentioned the phrase emblematic of the life of the collector, which, uh, which um, kind of struck me with a number of things going on in the exhibition, but also reminded me that Roy didn't mention too much about the South London Botanical Institute, right. uh, which is where this cabinet is from. It's a super interesting place, so it might be worth just spending a couple of minutes on that. <coughs> right. Yes. Well, the South London Botanical Institute was founded in 1912 by Alan Octavian Hume was also a founder of the Indian Congress Party. And it has been existing in Tulse Hill since 1910. And its purpose is to interest people in South London and people more widely in plants in a wide sense. Here again, the taxonomy of plants has changed because the way we interpret plants is in the early 20th century sense when plants included fungi and seaweeds, and nowadays fungi and seaweeds are no longer sort of plants, they seem to be kingdoms of their own. Uh, at least most seaweeds are. Uh, so we have this place which has been ticking over in South London, and we, for most of our time we've not had a great deal of money, so it's a bit of a time capsule, a bit of an Edwardian time capsule. Uh, obviously, we cannot compete for really big people like Hugh in the Natural History Museum, but we pride ourselves on being more approachable. You can come to visit us whenever we can get someone there to open the doors to this sort of thing. If we're not bureaucratic, we welcome people with any sort of interest, or any sort of potential interest. Anyone who potentially might be interested in any group of plants in a wider sense is welcome. So we maintain a herbarium, a library, we have a garden, which is described as one of the most compacted type of garden, even it's the smallest. <laughs> um, and I think, thinking along with taxonomy, and interestingly about the South London Botanical Institute is that until quite recently, it's considered to be an old place. It's a Victorian house with essentially early 20th century collections in it. But now we've sort of redefined ourselves because we had the Centenary of the Institute in 2010 and then last year we had the Centenary of our founder and Octavian's Hume's death. So we have reclassified ourselves to a certain extent. We're no longer owned, now we are historic. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, right. um, Mark, do you want to give a quick gloss? Yes, uh, so uh, taxonomy, um, very simply, is uh, a way of classifying things. So uh, we could all come up with um, different taxonomic systems. So, for example, uh, we, just, we could uh, we look at the animal world, for example. We could classify, we could all go away and, and come up with a classification, classification system so that we could know it's easy to break down and look at different groups. And we'd all come up with probably completely different things. So some people might say 
Uh, let's put whales and starfish and sharks and cod together because they live in the sea. That's a valid uh, classification. Um, or uh, things which are striped, things which are spotty, things that are black and white, and we'd end up with a group that contains zebras, cows, uh, some dogs, etc. Um, the idea behind the biological taxonomy, which is one of the taxonomies we'll be talking about, uh, came from a chap called Colin S. in 1758, the same year that Guinness was first produced. Um, so yeah, if you're a natural historian, that's the way to remember when Guinness was started, and if you're a drinker, that's the way to remember when uh, Linnaeus was. So his, uh, what he did was he tried to come up with a system, uh, a hierarchical system of ordering uh, life on Earth. So uh, a way of trying to work out which organisms were most closely related to other ones, and so then we can look at them in, in ever uh, smaller and smaller groups, and we can say, if we say something about this particular group, it means we're talking about the whole group. So very early on, you can imagine doing this practice, so you know that there are, there are uh, furry things, there are flying things, there are big things, there are small things. It was very, very simple to, to try and pick out some of those major groups, and that's the kind of things that we learn at school. So in the vertebrates, with animals with backbones, that's, that's one um, way of grouping uh, animals, so uh, chordata and vertebrata are two of these, two of these types of ranks. Um, we, have, we generally tend to have um, mammals, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, uh, I think I said fish. Um, so those were the, the main ways of being a vertebrate. Uh, and of course, once, once a lot of work was done to look at each of these individual groups, it turns out that there are more, there's more than one way of being a fish. There's at least four ways of being a fish today, and uh, many more ways of being a fish uh, in the geological past. We won't go into that. Uh, and it filters all the way down to uh, the bottom levels, which are genus and species, which um, I assume you're all uh, familiar with. So we are Homo sapiens, Homo is our genus, sapiens is our species. Sometimes there's another sapiens on the end, which is a subspecies, but again, uh, won't go into that. Uh, and the idea is that each of these, these uh, groupings uh, is a way of looking at how things are related to each other. Um, there aren't good definitions for each of these levels. The levels are kingdom, phylum, class, order, uh, naughty <laughs> mnemonic to remember. <laughs> Family, genus, and species. There are all kinds of ones in between. That was the that was the original system, more or less. It's been modified many times since. And uh, none of these to, to be in one or another of these these ranks and um, isn't necessarily defined apart from the one which is the species one. Uh, and technically, if you can interbreed and have viable offspring, um, then you are in the same species. But hopefully, some of you are thinking of problems. So, if you're looking at a fossil, how do you know whether uh, this lump of rock could uh, reproduce with this lump of rock. So paleobiologists uh, have come up with a separate system which involved measuring very, very different things like that. And there are also uh, examples of things which break that. So uh, you get hybrids, so you're probably all aware of tigrons and things like that, and zedonks, uh, which, are, which are animals which are considered separate species, so you've got lions and tigers, but they do, um, they do interbreed. But they sort of only do it at zoos and, and you know, multi-millionaires want these uh, exotic organisms. <laughs> so we discount that. Huh? Can I do that? Yeah. Right. Uh, is, there, is there more to the uh, uh, yeah, right. yeah, they said, so basically, it probably explained very, very poorly, but there's a, a lot to explain. It's a way of classifying things, uh, and it's a, yeah, it's a useful way of, it's a filing system, essentially. Thank you. That clarifies. Uh, um, I think we're going to come on to species definition in a bit, actually. I okay. think we'll return to that. Uh, what you Yes, in fact, the botanical um, classification derived from Linnaeus dates from 1753, uh, the date of Linnaeus' species Plantarum, which is also the year of death of Sir Hans Sloane, whose collections form the basis of the, both the Natural History Museum and the British Museum. And one of my jobs at the Natural History Museum was looking after Sloane collections. So plant classification under the main system dates from 1753. Around. Any more yes. often? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, so over the course of the kind of next uh, bit of time, it, one of the things I wanted to kind of look at was, um, so what I went into this project of curating this exhibition with a certain series of preconceptions about how um, archives and collections existed, and I think some of those were confirmed, um, and a lot of them were thrown out the window, really. Um, I suppose the first thing is that I imagined it was all about 
fixing things and it's sort of an organization system, but it's also one that's uh, changing all the time, uh, as, as has been touched on. Um, and I was thinking, you just uh, mentioned the title of her series, which is uh, Splitters and Lumpers, and I was thinking Roy um, has had experience of the sort of shifting, splitting, and lumping fans, I guess, so maybe you can say a little bit about that. Yes. Well, as I said, when I started the Natural History Museum as a site assistant in the Lycan Bavarian, then that was a period of lumping different groups that being lumped together into one group. Uh, when I retired, I decided I'd go back and help the Lycan curator with looking after his collections again. And in the last 48 years or so, things have switched completely. And now things are split even more than they were before the, I rearranged things in 1966. So things come and go. And I think um, we, we think, you know, now DNA will solve everything. But I can remember a time when chromosomes were the thing. Uh, we thought chromosomes would solve everything. And there was a little poem, despised in paradise your own, he did not count a chromosome, referring to someone who did a botanical revision without counting chromosomes. And that showed how important chromosomes were considered to be in those days. So things come and go, and possibly DNA, DNA has all the answers, but I think it's most likely that it is, that it is not, and no doubt, 20 years down the line, something else will be the big answer. But all these things do add up, and you coming together, we are, I think, slowly getting there. Uh, and, and what was it about the, the title spaces and numbers that all that kind of concept that, that appeared to you? Um, it just kept coming up in different ways, and there was something about the kind of notion that actually, I mean, I think taxonomy is a pretty pragmatic kind of science. Um, I wouldn't necessarily put it with the hard sciences, and a lot of the people who did seem to be pragmatists, um, and you know, they were they were kind of you know, and they had to be flexible. But I think you know, thinking of this woman kind of shouting at her specimens, that the kind of decision making process that went into deciding whether something was you know to be uh, basically whether lines were to be drawn was informed by. Um, you know, as much by science as by kind of previous knowledge, but also emotion, by imagination, by judgment, by subjectivity, and that all these things kind of came in, and it created for me a sense that things were kind of, you know, they, they didn't have to be a certain way, and actually there were very few absolutes in this um, science. Whether there was a tendency for people to be <coughs> doing more splitting or lumping, I think, you know, it's always great in a competitive resource environment if institutions can say, you know, we discovered 40 new species last year. So there's that kind of incentive to split because splitting enables you potentially to create new, new units. But on another basis, when kind of ecological policies and biodiversity is being, um, you know, decisions and resources are being allocated, actually it doesn't make sense necessarily to keep splitting and splitting and splitting. It makes more sense to potentially kind of lump. So, you know, there were competing pressures and incentives for these things, I think, in a practical, pragmatic sense. Does that uh, pragmatic approach tie with the uh, uh, Yeah, well, it's, it's, it is a bit of a nonsense, the whole text. So it's estimates, estimates of number of, of species uh, described and in total vary by hundreds of millions. Um, it's, it's, you know, there are one estimates on uh, how many organisms we think are still out there to describe, but there's no there's no sort of one central resource. And again, you might expect this from museums, from scientists. They're supposed to be you know very uh, organised and, and, and pedantic, but there isn't just one definitive list that you go to and say, oh, you know, did you know that there are X hundred thousand uh, species, but of any particular organism. But it, it, I think it needs to be very dynamic. It needs to be very flexible. There is a slight uh, cynically, I think, with people who are splitters, uh, if you if you name a new taxonomic rank, uh, your name and the date in which you described it always follows it. So there's a bit of a legacy, you know. Uh, let's look at this really, really obscure group of beetles that no one's looked at. And, you know, the tendency there, maybe I'll name eight species when really there's probably two. 
Um, so there is a worry that, that some of that stuff um, that goes on, but that's me being um, particularly uh, cynical. But yeah, it, it really depends, uh, and again, it comes back to the question of why we're doing it. There are other things which make certain taxonomic ranks important. So if we think about species, the word species and the idea species, even though it doesn't really have a definition, it's a bit woolly, is very, very important politically. So if you can get the organism you're interested in described or, or upgraded to a species, that carries a lot more weight in terms of conservation, efforts like that. So if you were to talk to a bunch of like-minded zoologists, you know, they might say, well, okay, let's just, let's just call this a species, even though technically it might not be, um, because that will up, it, up its um, priority when it comes to conservation. Uh, and there was a recent, just, just um, what Liz was saying, there was a recent poll run by the Naturalist Museum uh, about how familiar people are with certain animals. And the question that they were asking were they were presenting them with a photo of a frog and asking them whether they knew the scientific names, the genus and species for it. And of course not a lot of people did. Uh, and some people used that as, as evidence to say, you know, the, the biological literacy is falling, we need more biology classes, blah, 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 blah. But I'd be tempted to say, why would the average person need to know the scientific name of a frog? The word, they know it's a frog, and for all intents and purposes, <coughs> with their relations with frogs throughout their life, that label, that name, is sufficient. So we shouldn't need to, to stress about it. Uh, and so on the other hand, the lumping and splitting is really, really important, because it's looking at uh, things which have a human impact, so we always have to go for that selfish human impact, otherwise it's not worth doing. Um, or for things like, uh, uh, again, uh, disease or commercial exploiting. So there, there is an important end, and there's also a there's also a, a doing it for its own sake, which is And in terms of things that no one's looked at, and also the, um, I guess, the kind of non scientific terminology, uh, and I was wondering if you could talk about uh, another series by you, the Milk series, which um, I first came across in Australia a few years ago. Yeah, um, the Milk series are a series of photographs that um, explore indigenous Australian plant remedies. So they're um, indigenous plants to the sort of southern Sydney area, the region to the south of Sydney. And they are medicinal herbs, basically, that are used in, in that medical system. And they were, in terms of sort of the unveiling of species, if you like, that you were just talking about, I mean, these are all species that I've grown up with, that I had, I loved. Um, they were um, sort of symbols of my experience of Australia to me, many of them, like Banksia. And, um, I started to do this project, this um, public art project, which had a, a medical history backdrop, and I was researching the Western medical history of this local area. But then I was, I was starting to think about, well, there's going to be an indigenous medical history as well that I know nothing about. And I started to work with uh, an Australian indigenous botanist who was a font of knowledge about the, the medicinal systems of Australian plants. And suddenly there was this sort of whole new layers of meaning revealed behind these plants that I've never understood or been privy to. And a lot of that goes to other questions about the sort of negation of histories and, and the way Aboriginal history is being sort of dealt with in Australia. But for me it was just an incredible eye-opening, wow, um, like I can use tea tree to um, treat, well, tea tree is actually one of the ones we do know about, but various other <coughs> ones like paper bark and things like that. It made me realise the layers of meaning that are also embedded in species, that when one culture colonises another, so many of those knowledges and um, le levels of meaning are lost. And it was a really satisfying experience to kind of excavate them and um, bring them to presence in a way through the project and then the artwork. And Roy, does that sort of chime with all of your work in Baltimore? I think it is very disappointing that if you go through a herbarium as uh, such, you have the Natural History Museum in Kew, only about 1% or less of the species, specimens, have any information about how those uh, species were used in the past. And often when it is recorded, it says something like, good for women's complaints or something, <laughs> or what is a woman's complaint, <laughs> and which bit which is good, and how do you compare it? the information is exceedingly scanty. And of course we can understand this because, you know, if you're out collecting in the wilds of Africa or the Australian bush or wherever, and you haven't got much paper, you'll have all these exciting plants around you, you scribble out your notes and you 
probably can't speak the language of the local people. You can understand how people didn't collect a great deal of information about uses. But when we think of the tremendous amount we've lost, it really is incredibly sad. Yeah. I'll just reiterate the news. It's, I mean, these losses are going on now as well. That's what's also sad. I mean, you can sort of understand how those losses will have occurred over the centuries, but they're happening. That loss of knowledge is a sort of a live process that's going on now as well. And even when we have technically the means to, to I guess, retain knowledge, we don't have the, maybe the financial means or the political will or whatever it is that it takes. So we continue to lose those knowledges. And the other thing is, like, which you're really alluding to, is the knowledge is not contained in sound bites of um, swallow this um, to cure that. It's, um, it's an it, the knowledge is embedded in broader systems of culture and use of the plants and practice and daily lifestyles and the, the knowledge is part of an ecology of, of living and life for, for whichever people have been using it. So you have to put it within that context for it to have meaning as well. So I can understand why a sort of stray plant with a few words scribbled on, it's kind of a curiosity but nothing more really in terms of its use value. And you touched on the uh, idea of um, knowledge being lost now. We were talking before about kind of um, changing sort of fashions, I guess, in, in the way collections are, are organised and, and science is understood and things. Um, and that a lot of that does lead to um, uh, people, well not a lot, but it does lead to institutions bidding their collections and things. Um, and I guess, I don't know, Mark, if that, because you had to move the Grand Museum collection, and I was wondering what sort of, if you went through that decision making process, whether there are things worth keeping or Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really hard uh, decision to make. So it, it's a pretty much universal consensus that museums are full. So if you, you can pick museum professionals from most different walks of the museum and, and you say, you know, if I'll give you X million pounds, what do you want? And space will probably be in the top three, there just isn't enough space. So it's this really difficult conversation to have, um, depending on what kind of museum you are, if you're a national museum, who owns you, who runs you, uh, what do we do with, with all this stuff that we've got and how do we, how do we make intelligent assessments now over what will be needed or useful for the future? And there are, there are trends, so again, drawing from my own knowledge and experience, at the moment taxidermy is hugely popular. So taxidermy is one of those weird things that end up in natural history collections, um, even though they are essentially works of art. They make up a tiny, tiny proportion, so zoological collections, I think it's less than 1% is taxidermy. But they are the things that, that represent uh, natural history collections and, and um, animal studies people are very, very interested in taxidermy at the moment. So there are some institutions which are, which are you know, oh, why did we get rid of that horrible taxidermy when it became unpopular in the 19XYZ? Um, so you have to really think about why are we getting rid of it and what for? And when it comes to biological collections, it's this, again, think about information. It's not helpful to say that every specimen is unique. Of course, every specimen is unique, um, both on a genetic level, but also in terms of uh, when it was collected and, and, and where it fits. So if you're looking at baboons, you want to look at all baboons over time, as many baboons as you can get is, is you know, that, that will give you the best picture you could possibly generate about baboons. And um, that being said, if you've got a storeroom full of baboons with no data uh, and you're being told that you've got to make cuts, uh, you think, do, we, you know, do we necessarily get rid of these baboons or do we get rid of some other things? And ethically, museums should, although this is slightly changing, should get, only get rid of things which they know everything about. So the, the last thing you need is the object. But of course, those are your star specimens. You know, those, those are the ones you can put on display, you can, you can do exhibitions on, whereas you can't necessarily do an exhibition, although we do have some uh, objects here which I've never thought we would have found an exhibition on. Uh, you probably wouldn't be able to have an exhibition on you know, unlabeled 
fish bones that the curator probably had for lunch and have accidentally ended up in the collection. Um, but you never know, there might be Darwin's is lunch. That real? Is that yeah, yeah, so yeah, we do. Uh, curator's lunches form a, a section of natural history museums. So snails, uh, fish in particular. Um, but yes, you never know. Uh, and, and often it turns out that the time you do decide, you, there, there, are, there are processes you go through. A committee, uh, you make sure everyone's well, you, you made a reasonable effort to try and find out about these things. But inevitably, um, if, you're, if, if you're caught, these things are very transparent. When those things are transferred, uh, it turns out that they are Darwin's, or the most important, or the first, or the last, or the biggest, um, uh, and then you've got egg on your face. But we do have uh, Too Much Stuff, and there's a <coughs> paper from the National Museum Directors Group called Too Much Stuff. How do we deal with this? Um, and yeah, it's tricky. And, by their nature, museum people like stuff as well. So this is the uh, uh, sector inertia against getting rid of things um, and what decides to do. Um, I was thinking also in terms of that and, and what you keep and what you get rid of and how, so it's one of the things I always think about a lot in, in terms of this exhibition and this discussion is how the archive exists in time and is about, in some sense, it's fixing something in time, but also how it changes over time, particularly Helen's work, how um, there's that kind of fragility I think also this because your work is very much about, about that kind of temporary aspect in terms of um, the bundles there, which only existed. Mm. I mean, they thought I was very strange in the herbarium, that I was interested in. I mean, not all of those bundles were. Initially, I became interested in the kind of overlooked bundles or the bundles which were just left there because there wasn't enough information that the labelling had become um, detached from the specimen or whatever. So, initially, there was the kind of. Um, kind of overlooked and in a way that seemed to me to be a kind of interesting comment on the system itself, looking outside the system. Um, but the, yeah, so, the, so some of those bundles are, are, ex, are extremely old. Um, I think just going back to the point that you made before, there was a lot of discussion in Q about the relationship between the, the specimens, the physical specimens, and the, the kind of the increasing amounts of kind of digital and chemical data available for those specimens. Um, and the kind of the challenge of you know how that one system spoke to the other system, um, but it wasn't until really recently that I actually came across the whole notion that eventually, you know, the physical specimens themselves would be effectively replaced by all this data. But in a way that you know that there'll be no longer any kind of need in an academic sense, maybe in a public sense, there's still a need for specimens. So I think that's an interesting kind of thing when you think about, we're talking about time, so looking back but also thinking ahead um, as collections, you know, become more, you know, increasingly this knowledge is, you know, on computers um, rather than in cupboards. Um, Brian, what's your... Uh, well, I think the answer there is maybe so we know everything about a specimen. I mean, you know, 30 years ago, people didn't know anything about DNA. It was recently you know, and we'd have thrown away a specimen thinking we knew everything about it, but we'd have thrown away its DNA. And when DNA, people started looking at DNA in specimens, they had to remove quite a large chunk, and specimens from which you could extract DNA were not, could not be more than 20 years old. Well, now people could <coughs> extract DNA from very small pieces of specimens and much older specimens. So, obviously, you know, we never know the everything which people are going to need in the future. So I don't think we can ever say we know everything about any specimen and carry that everything forward. But one of the big problems I think with natural history collections, particularly in the national um, museums, is that they are increasingly being forced to go down the same line as the national art galleries have to go down. So if I was lending a herbarium specimen, which is unique, but is of virtually no commercial value, I'm being more and more forced to go down the same line as if I was lending a masterpiece in the National Gallery, which may be worth millions. So ideally, in the ideal world, I would have to inform about you know, what this thing looked like when it went out, and then when, I, when it came back, I'd have to examine it and say, well, that corner's a bit crumpled, or that sort of thing. Which is important, of course, if you're lending a, a painting by Turner or something. But, you know, this is one of the things which is slowing down scientific research at the moment. This 
uh, excessive documentation. But then on the other hand, uh, there are lots of examples of where that hasn't been done because it's been the science first over the, the object as an object. And, and you know, things, very important specimens have just gone missing or got lost. And so I think it's, it's a bit of a balancing act between both of, both of those things, looking after the objects. And that's, that's why I'm quite... It's only recently that curation in the traditional sense, it's only recently that curation in the traditional sense has really happened in natural history collections. So it was primarily run by scientific uh, researchers that so wasn't looking after these objects as um, objects. That wasn't a profession that wasn't professionalised. Um, and even today, the standards in in how you preserve, how you care for things preserved in fluid for 200 years are, are still being tested and developed. Um, so I think it is important for a bit, a bit of a balance between um, those two things you're talking about, Roy. And also coming on to DNA, um, recently there was a, I think it was maybe the 10th anniversary of the, the first genome. So it was all about genomes. We were sick of genomes. We've got a lot of genomes now. Um, and at the 10th anniversary talk, uh, the, whole, the whole conference was essentially, so what do we do with them now? <laughs> so uh, it was this, it was this, you know, this, it, was a, it was a vehicle for, for getting genomes done and sort of saying biology is important, look at these great discoveries we're doing. But it's only now that we're, we're looking around the edges. But of course, from a genome, from a, from a, a DNA series, uh, you can't tell what uh, an animal looks like, where it lives. And uh, we all think, or there's a perception that we know a lot about the natural world. And as soon as you start to narrow down, as soon as you start to look at a particular species, you'll find that for most things, our knowledge, for most species, our knowledge is, is, is so shallow. So there are entire species of whales that we don't know anything about, apart from uh, the fact that uh, their skeletons occasionally wash up. You know, these big, big animals, we know nothing about where they live, what they do, are they a species? Um, and that's the kind of stuff you can't get from a, from a genome, or you can't get from a, from a DNA sample. And of course, the, the best situation is to, is to combine both of those. You've got the DNA, but you've also got the, the old school, you know, you can identify it in the field, uh, and you know where it lives, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things I remember uh, Mark had written, or wrote, wrote, wrote somewhere, was about how um, the public, to use a horrible phrase, uh, privileged what was real. The first thing they asked was, so there, there seems to be this quite big difference between the kind of academic use of the collection of some kind and the kind of public um, use, uh, even though the, you know, the collection or some certain collections have to serve both of those um, kind of conflicting uses. And I was wondering um, whether if, if this is somewhere where potentially art comes in as something that can kind of navigate the differences in some ways and have an influence. Can you feel or disagree with Peter? Yeah, I mean, that's highly contested territory within the arts as well, really, the, or uh, highly explored in a way about um, the real versus the, um, I guess a lot of post-modernity was about um, fabrication, sort of presenting fakes and um, problematising the whole question of authenticity or realness. So it's something that's, um, I guess we've been exploring for 30 or 40 years. Um, what bearing it has on museum collections, it's um, I mean, for myself personally, I'm always drawn to the materiality of things, so the, the tangible, tactile, sensuous um, quality of things. So I end up inevitably always working with the real, if you sort of think of it simplistically. Um, I'm not really interested in working with things that are, I guess, fakes or fabrications of the real, but there are many artists that, that do explore that territory and they, they raise really provocative questions through exploring those those strategies. So I think it's um it's a very vexed question. All I can comment on is my own in sensibility the, and preference. In the Grand Museum we so uh, the question isn't real. So visitors when they come to the museum, be they five years old or be they ninety years old, one of the first couple of things that they'll say is uh, is it real? And that seems to be really, really important. And of course, you know, is it real is a very, very big question. And particularly in natural <coughs> history, we tend to think of all the specimens as, uh, you know, immutable. But 
if for every articulated skeleton, work of taxidermy, specimen preserved in fluid, there's lots of artifice there. So to, you know, the, to what extent are any of them real in a, in a kind of, you just pluck them from the natural world sense. But some of the things we've been asking our visitors are uh, questions like, is it okay, for is it acceptable for museums to lie? So if we are doing a, I don't know, doing a handling session or having an exhibition, and it's all about tigers, and we're telling you about tigers, and all the information about tigers, actually what we've got is a lion skull that we're using because you know, for whatever reason we don't have that particular tiger skull or uh, top on loan. Um, how important is that? And people were, our visitors, uh, we also asked them whether it, was, whether it was okay to display uh, replicas, casts and models. And visitors were quite happy as long as they were explicitly told what it was and quite understanding that the reason why you might have a replica or a fake, uh, we wouldn't call them fake, replica model or cast <laughs> is because you don't have the original, the original is very rare or it's to preserve it, fine, really understood that. But we're really, really outraged at the thought of being lied to and um, so it tends, really, really tapped into something uh, they didn't want, others just did not want to be lied to. Um, but it happens all the time, there's a number of exhibitions on at the moment where uh, where the, the bit saying this is actually a cast is very, very well hidden in some of the big London museums. Um, and I, I don't know, you know, I don't know why. Visitors are quite intelligent and they're not gonna they're not gonna run away if something's a, a replica. Um, Ice Age Art was uh, the was, was, <laughs> was one of them. So the, the image used to promote the exhibition was of the, the line figure. Um, and it had four labels, so the line figure's there, the label here, label here, label here. And there's a label at the back, and there's one sort of line saying, this is, a, this is an exact replica. Um, I missed it, uh, my colleague missed it, but we went to review it. Uh, it's my wife who works there. Oh, God, that's going into trouble. Uh, <laughs> somebody else, uh, yeah, somebody else who went and um, noticed it. But that's really, really important, the authenticity and the, the, the realness, um, and not lying. Um, I think there's, there's tons that, that we could cover, I think, but um, maybe we should 